Good morning. That was good over here. Let's go over here. Could just be my hearing. Good morning. Awesome. Now you guys online, they can't, we can't hear them. So good morning to you guys as well. Hey, I'm really excited that you're here today. We are going to continue the theme that we've been talking about over the last several months, really contributing to the goal of the entire year in 2024, which is for us to grow in our relationship with Christ, for us not to be the same people we were in January that we're going to be in December. My goal for you is that you look back over the year and you look at your lives and you are amazed how much God has done in you and through you that maybe you're going to be a different person. Now, I'm going to talk about a passage today that is going to be important for you. It'll be pivotal in your understanding of your relationship with God. And it's really a practical passage that talks about your practical relationship with God. And if you don't get this right, you may find yourself confused and disillusioned and possibly wounded. Now, I'm really excited today to have my mom and dad here from California. They're usually there online watching on Sunday mornings, but they're here, Rick and Shara Melek, doctors Rick and Shara, and uh, they're gonna be here for a few weeks, and uh, Joy and I have so much fun hanging out with them and uh, spending time with them. They brought with them their dog, Mandy, who is a 14-year-old Havanese, and she's been a great dog. She's a friendly dog. She's a smart dog, but she's an old dog. And when an old dog gives you a lot of good years in, in of their life and gives them to you, you treat them with respect and you take good care of them and you love them just like my mom and dad are loving Mandy. Now, when Mandy came to our house on the 4th of July, when mom and dad got here, they drove from California. My mom said, Mandy has some cataracts. Her eyes aren't great. And, you know, just like us, you know, I have to find reading glasses every time I try to look at anything. She doesn't hear uh, everything, kind of like Joy. She selects uh, a frequency where my voice, no, no, I'm just teasing. She's not in here yet, so I can say that. Don't tell her when she comes in. Um, you know, and, and Mandy, you know, she, she gets along. But um, mom told me, she did. She said, look, now Mandy probably isn't going to do stairs well. And I'm like, great. So Mandy's not going to try to do stairs well. And so, um, you know, I, I tried to anticipate and we tried to block off places that she might get in trouble. But for whatever reason, as Mandy was kind of motoring around the, you know, the house and sort of looking around and my dogs are, you know, being nice to her um, and, and, you know, getting acclimated, we're eating dinner. And I look out of the corner of my eye and uh, Mandy's over at the top of the stairs going down to our basement. And all of a sudden, Mandy just disappears. Zoop! And it's just like, boogada, boogada, boogada. And, and, and I, I'm horrified, right? I mean, she just disappears. And so I jump up and I run over to the top of the steps thinking, now the story ends well. So now that's the reason I'm telling it. If it didn't end well, I wouldn't be telling the story. Mom and dad would probably already be home. We'd have this problem. And and um, it ends well. But I go over to the top of the stairs and, and Mandy's laying there and she's standing up and she's like disoriented and she's got one arm straight up in the air, like, go help me, Jesus. Or she hurt her arm, which was probably the case. And so I run down the stairs and I pick her up and I'm like, oh, be, please be okay, right? I don't want to break my mom and dad's dog ever, but especially on their first night here. And so we bring her up back upstairs, you know, and, and I hand her to mom and, you know, she can't really walk that well. And we take, take her to the vet and she's fine. I mean, she had bumps and bruises and, you know, she's 14 years old and, and ended up okay. But the point is this, that she one time was just motoring around the house, just checking it out, having a great day. The very next second, she found herself having tumbled down 13 stairs, laying disoriented at the bottom in a heap and not having any idea why or what happened to her. I want to prevent that from happening to you in life, as you are wandering through life, as you're walking through life, as you're living with purpose. I want to keep you from the things that may cause you to tumble down the stairs and end up in a heap. This passage today is one of those things that can teach you how to prevent that from happening. Now, I'm going to date myself. Uh, well, you know how old I am. I told you all the time I'm 54 years old, right? Getting older every single day because that's the way it's supposed to work. And I liked uh, a show growing up, my favorite TV show. Some of you guys out here, I know you're going to track with me, but it was my favorite TV show. It was on at 7 p.m. on Friday night um, back in the 80s and um, I think maybe even the late 70s, but especially the early 80s. And it took place in the South. And um, anybody tracking yet? Anybody have any guesses um, what I may be talking about? With the, the Dukes of Hazard was my favorite show. Oh, thank you very much. 
first service, I mentioned it. Second service, we have uh, a multimedia support. Um, Dukes of Hazard. For those of you kids that don't know, it was a show that came on every Friday and you actually had to be there to watch it when it came on. We didn't even have a VHS at the time that you could hit record on and, and watch it later. If you weren't there, you missed it. And if you missed it, you couldn't find out what happened. You had to ask your friends the next day. And Dukes of Hazard was an amazing show. They had this beautiful woman on it. And as a kid, I waited for the, the beginning to start because in the beginning, if you watched very, very closely, you saw Catherine Bach, Daisy Duke, standing there in a bikini and she drove a Jeep. It was life goals for me at that age. And, and I looked forward to it. Now, this last week, Joy and I, we've been binge watching on Netflix and we watched five episodes of our favorite show on demand all at once in one evening. I can watch what I want, when I want, however I want, because that's the way it is now. And it didn't used to be that way. When you view God, do you view God as an on-demand God, as the kind of God that you can get whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want it, because you deserve it. And that's what you feel like you have coming. Or are you willing to acknowledge that you have to be in the right place at the right time and line up with his plan? Maybe I could say it a different way. God's job is not to serve you and to make you happy. He's not an on-demand God. God's not a genie who lives in a lamp. And when things aren't going well or you need a little help, you can rub the lamp and out pops the genie and does exactly what you want. God is not a vending machine where you can walk to the vending machine. You can put in your, used to be 50 cents, now it's probably three bucks and push a button and get exactly what you want. That our job is to glorify God with our lives. And God's job is not to simply glorify us. So where does that leave us? If God was my puppet and did everything I wanted, he wouldn't be trustworthy because I am not trustworthy. And I don't want a puppet God. And I don't wanna be the puppet master. And today we're gonna to talk about what that looks like in our lives. So let's look together at a passage of scripture where the apostle Paul is picking up in the middle of a thought, a theme, Romans chapter eight, where he's talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the security of our salvation. He's talking about the fact that once we become believers, confess our sin, believe who Jesus is and pledge to follow him, that we can never lose our salvation. He's talking about life in Christ and how when we have our faith and our trust in Jesus, that Christ's love for us grounds us and will take us through everything we find ourselves in the middle of, even if God doesn't do exactly what we want or what we demand. So let's read it together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now that doesn't sound like a great way to start a, a summer Sunday morning talking about sheep and slaughter. And I already talked about a dog falling down the stairs. It'll get better. Just stick around. But it, this is a Psalm that Paul is quoting. It's from Psalm 44 and it fits in context. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Put that in your pocket. We're coming back to it. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing that happens to you and nothing that you experience has the power to separate you from your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That God's got you no matter what you go through and he'll give you everything you need as long as you allow him to. By arming yourself with correct knowledge and positioning yourself in a way where you allow him to be the boss and you don't demand that he be your on-demand God. Now, as we break this down, we see two things. The apostle Paul uses the word who, 
And who can mean who, it can also mean what. And he's talking about a lot of what's or that's in this list. And so we know that we're talking about that's and the love of Christ that he mentions is not your love for Christ. It's all about Christ's love for you. So what grounds you and secures your salvation, what grounds you and secures your faith, what grounds you and secures your peace that guarantees your joy, that gives you hope, is Christ's love for you. Let me say it a different way. God does not have to prove that he loves you by doing what you want him to. God has proven that he loves you by giving you Jesus Christ. And it's in Christ's love for you that you are okay. And that may not seem like a loaded statement to you, but that statement changes everything. And the apostle Paul is a real person who's writing a list of things that he has been through in his life. And your list might look different, but let me break down the list that he gives, the things that he's been through as he's trying to connect with the audience who originally heard this and also connecting with you through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, there's a bunch of stuff that's gonna happen. And the first one he says is, uh, well, you're gonna go through some, some trouble. You're gonna go through some bad stuff some times of difficulty. And then not only are you gonna go through some external times of difficulty, but you're gonna have an internal response to those times of difficulty because you're not gonna like what's happening. Now for the apostle Paul, he went through some amazingly difficult stuff. He was shipwrecked. He was before shipwrecked in the middle of a storm, chained to soldiers who he probably didn't like, but was commanded to love, sharing a gospel that he desperately wanted people to believe, but most rejected not knowing literally from one moment to the next if he was going to stay healthy, if he was going to stay alive, learning to live for the pleasure of Jesus Christ, fighting the internal battle that you and I may fight or would have fought if we were him. If nothing else, the frustration of, is this really working? Am I just beating my head against a wall? And he's writing this list of things that you and I, we can connect with. And he says, there'll be things from the outside. You're gonna have reactions from the inside. You'll be persecuted by, by living your faith. There are things that you'll choose not to do because you're a believer. There'll thing, there are things that you choose to do in your lives because you're a follower of Christ that will make other people not understand and in some cases, well, maybe even ridicule you, you'll pay a price. And he said, there's times when I've been hungry, not knowing if I am gonna have enough to eat. There's times when I've been naked, not necessarily totally naked running around like a streaker, but not having enough to provide for himself in the way that, that you would wanna provide for yourself. He goes on in his list and he says, there's gonna be danger as I have been in danger. And some may even face the sword. And it wasn't the three foot long sword that comes from battle. This was referring to the small sword that was used in assassination, self-defense and also executions, which ironically enough, he found out at the end of his life in a very final way. So he lays this list out there and he said, these are some things that you may go through in life, but I don't want you to get frustrated or I don't want you to get discouraged because even though we don't serve an on-demand God who exists to do what we tell him to do, we serve a God who loves us and has proven his love by giving us Jesus so we are more than conquerors as we go through difficult times in life. Never once does he say, if you have a strong enough faith, God will pull you out of the difficult times. Never once does he say, if you believe enough, give enough, pray enough, that he'll keep you from going through difficult times. He says that as we go through these difficult times, because God showed his love through Jesus, 
We have everything we need within us as we trust in him to be more than conquerors. And the word more than conquerors literally means uber conqueror or extra conqueror. Or you think you're going to win the fight, but God's going to give you so much that you'll have more than you need. And it means at least two things. And the Apostle Paul experienced this in the second section. When we're together, I'm going to talk to you about what it means in your life. But right now, let's think about what it meant in his The first is that as you go through these terrible things, you're going to come out the other side a better and stronger person because the Holy Spirit uses the worst things intended for you to bring out the best things possible from you or within you because that's in fact what God, what he does. It's almost a a shameful cliche, but it sort of works that God is much more concerned about our character than he is our comfort. And sometimes he allows us to be uncomfortable because he's much more concerned about what we come out with than what we've gone in with. In Romans 8, a little earlier in this passage, we see that we know that all things work together for good for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. But this is written by a man who's not standing at the end of his life going, you see everything worked out. You see everything's fair. You see everything. He's still in the middle of it. He doesn't know what tomorrow's gonna hold, literally, and can stand back and say, because of the love of Christ, we are more than conquerors. When we go in, we're going to come out. And when we come out, we're going to be better, stronger. We're going to grow. So this year, 2024, as we've entered into a year of growing spiritually, of trying to to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, to be a different person. It's not a year without adversity, without trouble. Some of you guys are suffering, I know it. Some of you are tired. And I know some of you probably wanna quit. And I don't want you to quit. And I know you're tired. And I want to arm you with the truth that will allow you to embrace the reality that through Christ, he will more than conquer what you're going through. Well, the second thing the apostle Paul knew and experienced, he wrote to us in 2 Corinthians, and this is in chapter four, but this is the the second thing that happens to us and in us as we work through this stuff we begin to focus on the reality yet to come. For our light and momentary troubles, and he listed a lot of those already in Romans 8, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. He's not denying the existence of the junk you go through. He's saying that in comparison with what he's doing in your life and through you, that the balance isn't even close that what he's doing is so much more important than what you're going through, that not only is it worth it, but it's necessary. He said it outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what we see, even though it hurts, even though it's real, and even though we wish it would go away or was different. But we fix them on what we can't see, but what we know since what is seen is temporary, but what we can't see is eternal. We're gonna sing a couple songs and when we come back, we're gonna look at the rest of this passage and we're gonna apply it to our lives. And I'm just gonna give you three things that I, I hope will round out your perspective and arm you with this truth. Because I don't want, as we wander around in this life, for us to end up accidentally falling into an unknown trap, tumbling down 13 stairs, picking ourselves off and wondering what in the world happened. As I was standing there on the front row, um, listening to you sing, I was just kind of thinking about how this could be a little overwhelming for some of you and it's overwhelming for me. And I just want to encourage you because one of the things I'm talking about or the main thing that I'm talking about today um, is a, it's a really difficult a concept, not just to grasp, but to, to actually employ, to use, to believe and, and put into practice. And 
you know, it's kind of like this whole spiritual walk and spiritual growth and us working on this stuff together is kind of like a savings account. Most of us can't afford to just go populate a savings account immediately, right? With enough money to last us through anything we need. Um, we just have to put in a little bit at a time. And as you put in a little bit at a time, over time, you find that as you've built something up, you have everything that you need when you need it. And so every single week we add a little deposit into who you are spiritually, to your understanding, into who we are as Christians and how we perceive our relationship with God and, and we're growing together. And so I just wanna encourage you, just keep coming, keep leaning in and keep putting these deposits in your spiritual bank account. Um, because it is a lot, it's big, but it's something God is doing within you. Uh, let's keep reading. I wanna read the rest of the passage to you. And I'm just gonna give you three very simple things. Maybe you can apply this to you, to you and your life very personally. So the Apostle Paul, he kind of breaks down, I think in an emotional sort of an appeal as we pastors are prone to do from time to time. And, and he's just speaking his heart. This is a real person who really loves the people he's writing to and in turn loves you even though he doesn't know you through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God who's giving the words of God to you just like he was giving them. And he says, listen, I am convinced. And he's convinced not because it's just been here. It's convinced, he's convinced because it's become a part of here. It's become a part of here and here. And he's seen God over and over again do this in his life. I'm wholeheartedly, 100%, completely and comprehensively convinced that neither death nor life, whether I live or die, neither angels or demons, neither present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. The love of God that's shown us, demonstrated to us, given us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's God's love through Christ. The first thing I wanna let you know or to remind you of is that God's heart is always loving. And he loves perfectly. And he loves no matter what you've been through, what you've done, who you are, he loves you. He knows you can't hide. He sees you and he loves you scares most of us to think about being fully seen. And as God fully sees, he fully loves. And he loves through Christ, who forgave that which is seen and unseen, known and unknown. He loves you. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or the sword? Well, most of you are not gonna end up waking up naked with a sword to your throat unless you've had one too many. And that's how you know you've had one too many if you wake up naked with a sword to your throat. So what does he mean to us? Let's make it personal. What it might look like in my life and in, in your life, I don't know. Let's just, let's just take a guess. If Paul wrote that today, maybe he says nothing can separate us from our love of Christ, Christ's love of us, maybe financial trouble, maybe relational hardship, maybe depression or anxiety, maybe a divorce or abandonment maybe cancer or a disease, maybe the loss of a job, the temporary inability to, to make ends meet. Paul answers this. He says, your list may look a little different than my list, but everybody goes through things that can be overwhelming, that can potentially shipwreck us. But in all of these things through Christ, we are more than conquerors, uber conquerors, over conquerors. God's heart is always loving and he does not need to prove his love to us by doing what we want. 
I had just spent 10 days with Emory, not recently, but a week and a half ago, my two and a half year old granddaughter. And as I told you the last time I went to see her, Emory is not, um, well, it's like negotiating with a terrorist, right? At two years old. And my policy is not to negotiate with terrorists, right? But with Emory, she's so cute. Sometimes you just, you have to, but I mean, you'll look her in the eye and you say, okay, we're gonna do this. And she'll say, okay, we have an agreement and I'll do exactly what I'm supposed to do. And then she'll go do whatever she was gonna do anyway. And you're like, what did our conversation mean? It meant absolutely nothing. Well, this time she's learned to be a little more complex in her thought processes. And she's learned to be a little bit more, I'm not gonna say manipulative because she's my granddaughter and she's perfect. But if she wasn't my granddaughter and perfect, maybe she tries to manipulate her just a hair. And I'm not as smart as she is, so it's not that hard. So we're walking through Walmart, which is where we were every single day in the 10 days we were there because Joy fed 10 people most of the time. My boys, their friends, Walmart every day. And I took Emory. And so we're motoring through, you know, I'm just pushing the cart, pushing the cart, Emery's sitting in the cart and she's talking and she's got lots of words, lots of words, right? Sound familiar to you? She wants lots of things. She wants shiny things. She wants things that taste good never grabs green beans, <laughs> always grabs the Pop-Tarts, Emery. And um, one of the greatest and most loving things that I can do for her is as I've shared with you before, tell her no. Because the things that are easy to reach, the things that taste good, the things that are shiny, the things we try to throw in our cart are oftentimes the very things that God loves us too much to give us. But if we're not careful, we stamp our foot and say, if you don't, then you're not good. If you don't, is there a God? If you don't, why should I trust you? If you don't, why should I love you? And we treat him like he's a puppet God. And we are the puppet master. And God is perfectly loving. And this is what he promises. I may or may not take away the things that you're going through. The apostle Paul himself had something in his life, a thorn in the flesh that he begged God to take away. Three times, take it away. God says, no, take it away. No, take it away. Please take it away. No. And Jesus answered him and said, my gracious favor is all you need. My strength is sufficient because when you're weak, when you're broken, when you're tired, when you're tempted to quit, but you don't, people are gonna see my strength in your life. So will you stick around? But that's really hard. God does promise his presence. He does promise in the middle of the most difficult things we go through, that we can find a supernatural joy. He promises us hope. He just doesn't guarantee us that it's gonna go away. The second thing that we can trust is that God's way is always perfect. And sometimes you and I have to recognize and admit that we just don't understand. Isaiah 55, eight and nine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You're not God, so why? Act like God. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what are you gonna do about it? Because we often live in a way where we say, God, my thoughts are better than your thoughts, and I know the plan that I have for my life. And if you'll just get with the plan and quit making me dance around and waste time, we might accomplish something. And instead of accomplishing something, we accomplish nothing. Because he loves us too much to just simply give us what we think we want. He loves us enough to change our wanter if we stick around. The staff and I sometimes share memes. Do you have anybody in your life that sends you Facebook videos and reels and things like that? Anyone in your life? Are you a, a serial 
meme sender, real sender. Anybody in here have a problem sending too many? Yeah. Some people are pointing at spouses. I get it. Um, so for those of you whose spouses send you tons of memes, do you actually have respond to every single one or do they get mad if you don't give a thumbs up or a smiley face? I mean, some people, you know, they do. They have their own meme etiquette. Well, our staff, we send memes and reels and Facebook videos to each other and Instagram and most of the time they're good. And, you know, if we have time, we, we, we you know, we watch them or read them and stuff and chuckle and we kind of know where each other are. Please don't send us any more. We have plenty of them. But Pastor Dan sent me one the other day and probably Lori sent it to him, to be honest, because it was really Really good. So I assume it came from Lori. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kidding. Of, of course about that. Well, yeah. I mean, did it come from Lori? Yeah. No. Okay. Probably. Yeah. So it was a couple and they were sitting there and they were in a, either a counseling session or deep conversation, looking into each other's eyes, right? Not their phones, not over each other's shoulder, like into each other's eyes. And they were answering a question. The question was compelling to me. The question was this, if you could take away any pain or anything that caused a certain pain in the person who you love more than anybody else, what would that pain or that thing be that you would choose to take away? Think about that one for a second. I thought about first my wife because I love her more than anybody else. What would I take away from her, the pain? What would you take away? I thought about my own life. Kind of got me in sort of a quandary because I sometimes way overthink these things. I'll get stuck in a loop and you know, I just keep on wearing it out until I just decide to let it go. And as I thought about each time in my life where something really hurt, whether I caused it whether somebody else did something to me or someone else caused it, or whether it just happened, that with every single thing that happened to me, something came out of it on the other end that I wouldn't want to let go of. And so I had to ask myself and answer the question, would I be willing to lose what good came out just to eliminate the pain that I went through? Are you tracking with me? And my answer was no that I ultimately ended up with the conclusion that the only thing that I would take away is the pain that I caused other people. I was talking to a couple in our church who I have the privilege of marrying in just a couple hours. I'm gonna perform the wedding ceremony. And um, it's pretty exciting because um, they're both about my age and they both have married before. And as we sat and talked about their relationship, and how excited and thankful they were that God had led them together. We talked about a windy road. And if you look at your life, your life may be a windy road as well. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is rapidly becoming my favorite passage in all of scripture. And I know I say that about every passage I teach. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll make your twisty, messed up, spider webby, zigzaggy path, straight as an arrow. And we were talking about the path that led them to each other. In previous marriages that gave them pain, it also gave them children who they love. What a quandary, would you take away the pain and not experience and enjoy the children? With every terrible experience and everything we wish didn't happen, God brings something out of that, either for us or within us that I personally wouldn't want to give up. And this is the way that life works. As we journey, just like the apostle Paul in a ship on the way to a destination, we journey. And as we journey, we will hit obstacles in life. And sometimes these things are massive obstacles. Sometimes they're things that you have no idea how you'll ever get past. And because of the love of Christ, and because we don't quit, as we move through life, we see them, we experience them, we address them, they hurt, but eventually we leave them back here. And we see them in the rear view, but the longer we live, the smaller they are and the less we see, unless we choose to hang on. 
Some tether their ships to the rock and say, because this happened to me, it is now going to be my identity, my bearing point. And I'm going to have a chain that tethers me to this. And I can only go so far in life before I hit the end of the rope and come back to this event, to this person, to this thing. And even though I can't see it, God's ways are, they're always perfect. They're always trustworthy. And he makes this weird, windy path that you and I just absolutely destroy. He makes it straight. But we have to be willing to allow him to. The final thing, God's presence is always enough. Not sometimes, not often, always. The Lord's my shepherd. I lack nothing. Now this is in the NIV. If you're a churchy like me, you grew up and you memorized Psalm 23 in the King James. Um, NIV is what I teach out of. You'll probably be able to make your own translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And here we go. What I want you to pay attention to right now, God's presence is always enough. Even though I walk through some of the darkest times in life, they will not define me or tether me. They will not chain me. I will fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. God's presence is enough. I wanna tell you a quick story as we close. It's about a friend of mine named Eric. And um, Eric had a surgery a couple weeks ago. And um, he went into the doctor, 50 years old, um, went into the doctor and the doctor said, oh, you have some clogged arteries or something. I'm not a doctor. You need um, stents, shunts, intervention, no big deal. Um, turned out to be a big deal. He ended up with uh, bypass open heart surgery. Um, don't know all the details. I just know it became very serious very quickly. And um, Eric was a person of very, very strong and real faith. Um, the kind of person who, even though you may not know him really well, made everybody feel like you were his best friend. You may not know Eric personally, but you know his farm and his parents' farm because when COVID happened, remember COVID? Uh, <laughs> seems like a distant memory, right? We put that in the rear view when we keep on moving. Um, remember Easter when Easter was like no other Easter and churches were shut down and Jared and I and the worship team, we went to a farm and we, we filmed at this beautiful farm and, and winery. Well, that was their winery, their farm. We used to sit right over here about three rows back. And so um, when Eric was going in for his surgery, his, his open heart surgery, I was in Arkansas, I couldn't be with him. And uh, I texted him right before he went in to find out if I could talk with him and what the timing was and everything. And I shared this at his funeral last Saturday. And I wanna share it with you because um, I had told him we're praying for him, told him the staff knew and that we were you know, there for him. And, and this is what he sent me. He said, thank you, I truly appreciate it. He said, I'm a little nervous. Now, this was an understatement. Because if I was gonna be going through that, a little nervous, uh-uh. Now, I may tell you that, because I wanted to sound pastoral and full of faith. I'd be freaking out, even though I walked through the darkest valley. I know I'll have a long recovery, but I have faith in God's plan. Put that one in your bank right there as number one. I found your sermon yesterday to be timely. I like him, right? Anybody who likes my sermons. Uh, nerves have me questioning the life I've lived. As should we all. And examine our hearts. But your sermon reminded me that no one is perfect. And here's where I want you to really pay attention. I'm thankful for God's love and for God's grace. So then I said, hey, can I call you? And I called him and this is what he told me. 
I don't think I'm making it through. And I said, Eric, no one thinks they're making it through. Everybody thinks they're not gonna make it through. He goes, no, I really don't think I'm gonna make it through. And he goes, it's okay. I've examined my heart. My faith is real. And um, I thought I was calling to minister to him. But in reality, uh-uh. I got off the phone and I felt like I'd been involved in something powerful. He said, I trust the Lord, whatever comes next. 50, by the way, not 105, 50. Goes through the surgery, texts me the next morning. Really difficult, long road to recovery, optimistic. Pastor Jared goes and meets with them, sits by him in the hospital room. And he said, hey, I'm not, probably not gonna make it. So I just feel that I'm not gonna make it. The doctors didn't say that, he just believed it. He told Pastor Jared, he said, you know, I'm really okay. He said, I'm confident in God's love and I'm confident in God's plan. A day later, his best friend was spending the evening with him in the hospital room and it was time for him to go. And as he left, they prayed together. And Eric said, I'm being told I'm not gonna make it. I, I sense I'm not gonna make it. And his friend was like, no, you're gonna make it. You're gonna be fine. He goes, no, I'm serious. I'm not going to make it. So his best friend, after praying with him, said, I'm gonna stay with you. And he goes, no. He said, don't stay with me. He said, I'm not alone. He said, I'm fine. He said, go home. And so reluctantly he did, because if you knew Eric, you know he would never let him stay. And Eric, about 4.30 in the morning after ordering some things on Amazon to take care of his recovery, sat down on the side of his bed and had cardiac arrest and passed away. And it's tragic because he's 50, but it's tremendous because in the middle of the darkest time that anybody could face in their life, he had deposited enough along the way to where the love of Christ helped him uber overcome and you may say, well, he didn't come out the other side any better than he went in. And I would argue with you and say he came out the best on the other side that he could ever come out after going in. And in many ways, that's encouraged me. And it's reminded me of the kind of faith that I wanna have and that I want us to have. Because that's the kind of faith that's unshakable. So I end with the question that we begin with, and that is, Who's the boss? Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the time we've spent together. And I pray that you would be with my friends, Father, and I love them. And I'm burdened to that they grasp this truth. I fully acknowledge it can seem overwhelming, but we do it a little at a time. One deposit after another, after another, after another, after another. And pretty soon we don't recognize the person we've become because you have transformed us into a brand new person, giving us the power to face life and to face death. I want that so badly for us, for my friends, that your strength will be seen even in the middle of our weakness, even in the middle of our darkest times. And Father, I just pray that as we leave this place, that we won't leave the truth behind, that we will deposit it deep into our hearts, to our souls, that we will live differently for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.